Welcome back. This is part two of the chapter two, 22 AP Biology lecture. Um, we left off talking about Darwin and his travels in the 1830s. Uh, in 1858, Alfred Wallace sent uh, a paper to Darwin saying, essentially, look, I came up with the same ideas you did. Uh, you've done a lot of the legwork. Your evidence is more compelling than is mine. But if you're not going to publish, it's been 20 years since you, since you did your research. If you're not going to publish, I will. So essentially, July 1st of that year, they, they did a dual presentation uh, to the Linnaean Society of London. Darwin gets the credit because he did publish on, on the origin of species uh, the following year. Uh, he, it, it sold out and has been reprinted many, many times. Uh, but notice that, um, or maybe not notice, uh, but it's important to note that Darwin never said the word evolution. He said uh, the origin of species by means of natural selection. Um, he's best remembered uh, because, of, again, because of the overwhel uh, overwhelming evidence. Plus, he was better known than Wallace. He was more famous at the time. More people knew who he was um, before his publication. So he got the credit because people had heard his name before. Um, and the Darwinian view does say uh, the history of life like a tree uh, over time. We all come from a, 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 the, the trunk of the tree, and over time, the life forms, the organisms branch off and become a little bit more different. We don't completely lose those characteristics, but we gain some new ones. And he said that the current diversity of life is caused by the forks from common ancestors. And, and this is a picture from his book. Uh, you see uh, where he kind of circled that one right there. That's the only indicator of, of one uh first life organism, life, life, life organism, one <laughs> life form is the word I was looking for, uh, and then, so all life is pretty similar, and then some life can photosynthesize, and some life needs to consume, and some life can chemosynthesize, and then those become different, and these become different, and then soon we end up with a huge amount of diversity of life. Here you're seeing a, a, a computerized version that shows that Darwin wasn't far off, based on our uh, phenotypic observations based on our genotypic information, uh, Darwin had, had a pretty good idea. Origin of species suggested that the mechanism for evolution was natural selection. Uh, definitely did document the occurrence of evolution and showed here's how organisms can change over time. So Darwin made a couple of, of observations and a couple of inferences. His first observation is that members of a population vary greatly in their traits. You see these snails, they all have different different uh, phenotypes in their shell. Uh, think about the all the people you know. Think about all the dogs that you know. Any members of any population, they're going to have a lot of differences in their traits. Observation two. Remember, we're talking 1858 here. This is before Mendel has even done his research. We're five years, six years before Mendel's even done his research. We're 40 years from Mendel's research being rediscovered and, and accepted widely. So he doesn't know anything about Mendelian genetics. He, he doesn't really know anything about genetics. He just says somehow, some way, stuff is passed from parent to offspring. What, somehow those traits go from parent to offspring. Don't know if it's protein, don't know what's, what's being passed, but there's something that's genetic. And then observation three is that all species are capable of producing more offspring than their environment can support. Observation four, some survive, some don't. If you have too many offspring, some are going to make it, some are not. Owing to lack of food or owing to maybe there are many predators, somehow, some way, not all of the organisms, not all of the offspring survive. So the inferences that kind of come off of that are individuals that have those inherited traits that give them a higher probability of surviving and making babies tend to have more offspring than the other individuals. Well, that makes sense. If you have genetic traits that make you healthier and make you better at reproducing, you're going to leave more offspring than someone who doesn't have those adaptations. That unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to accumulation of favorable traits in the population over time. Because, ideally, the desirable traits, they get to mate and make babies, so their traits will be represented in the next generation, 
whereas undesirable traits won't. So they're, the next generation won't have those genes. Now we know about recessives and things like that now, um, but those are things that we didn't know about in the 1850s. Nature determines which characteristics are favorable. You'll hear me say this a lot over the course of this unit. Two things drive evolution. Mate choice and survival success. Can you survive long enough to make babies and can you convince someone else to make babies with you? If you can do those things, you win. You get to leave offspring that look like you in the next generation. Here's a picture that shows that uh, natural selection in action. Somewhere on this slide, there's an insect. I'm intentionally not showing you where the insect is. Look for it. That's a pretty good survival mechanism. Here we are, these higher order creatures, and we can't even see which one it is. Part of Darwin's success was because he based a lot of his ideas on artificial selection. Artificial selection, we take big strong, we want a big strong uh, workhorse, so we take a big strong male horse, big strong female horse, we made them together and they have a big strong baby. Same thing with racehorses and dogs and things along those lines. Uh, vegetables, same kind of thing. If we select for leaves, we end up with kale. We, these all have the same parent organism, wild mustard. If we select for leaves, we end up with kale. If we select for the side buds, we end up with Brussels sprouts. If we artificially select for the uh, apical meristem, which is the very tip, we end up with cabbage. If we select for flowers and stems, we end up with broccoli. If we select just for stems, we end up with kohlrabi. So we artificially changed one species into five. Life changes over time. Another example that we see uh, today is uh, pesticide resistance. Notice that there's a, a, a one gene right here on this chromosome that gives resistance to that insecticide. So we kill four out of five. The fifth survives. Now all of its offspring are able are immune to this insecticide. And we've cleared out the competition, so there's plenty of food, water, shelter for this survivor uh, to reproduce. Like I said, evolution success is measured by can you survive and can you reproduce. The winner is whoever has the most kids. So in order for natural selection to, to work, you have to have variations within a population in huge amounts of time. Think back to gradualism and Charles Lyell and uniformitarianism and some of those ideas. Some of the kind of nuances uh, are that populations are the units of evolution. Individuals can't evolve. I can't evolve. I can adapt. I can do something I already do a little bit better. If I move to Antarctica, I'm not going to suddenly sprout snowshoes for feet. I might grow some more hair. I might shiver a little bit more than I normally do. And then only inherited characteristics can evolve. Think back to the muscle mass and, and the orange people. They can't pass those along because... Those aren't heritable traits. Those aren't genetic traits. Some things appear to allow species to evolve outside of natural selection, like culture and learning. We've been able to, to do things. We've been able to sort of rise above the, the survival and reproduction uh, measures of success. 